Good morning, Rashid. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I want to congratulate you on this book. Uh, it, it is really a, um, uh, it's, it's like a lifetime achievement type uh, book. What I would tell readers uh, just, uh, is that this book, um, called The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, represents kind of uh, what I would say is Rashid Khalidi's uh, leading historian's uh, mature, reflective analysis of what has occurred in the conflict over the last hundred years. And it's a, a new understanding, and I think a very uh, um, clarifying understanding. Uh, he, he, in this book, uh, Rashid takes many incidents that we've thought about a lot of ways and lines them up in a new sort of uh, uh, understanding. And um, as this sort of concerted colonial war on Palestine and um, uh, arranges uh, historical episodes in, in a way that um, gives them m much greater um, uh, clarity to me. And uh, on top of that, there is a very personal component to this book. So. Uh, Rashid is talking about uh, uh, his own family, a legendary family in Palestine, his great uncle, great, great, great uncle, who was an Ottoman official, a mayor of Jerusalem, uh, who communicated with Herzl back in 1899 to say, hey, maybe you shouldn't be going forward with this, and brings that forward to um, uh, uh, Rashid's own involvement, uh, intimate involvement in Madrid and the Oslo peace process, and his, his some of his uh, personal encounters with uh, uh, some uh, well-known um, uh, figures, including uh, uh, some encounters with Yasser Arafat that I want to ask him about. So, uh, but I, people are not tuning in to hear me, so let's move on to um, our guest, and I'd like to ask Rashid first, you have written about this uh, uh, conflict and this historical question from a, several times now. You've taken several cracks at it. That's the the, the privilege and and the duty of some of a historian to return to a subject that is so monumental as this one. But tell us what you would say is new about this book. Well, thanks for having me, uh, uh, Phil, and doing this. Um, I think a couple of things. Uh, the first is the one that you alluded to, which is that I try and put this conflict in a new framework, or at least in a framework that's going to be unfamiliar to most readers. Um, I'm taking episodes that everybody knows about, the Balfour Declaration, the 67 War, uh, Oslo, whatever, um, or it should know about, and I am not giving the standard version, quite the contrary. I put them into a context where I see these as elements of not a tragic conflict between two peoples, but a colonial, a ruthless, merciless, century-long colonial war waged on an indigenous people to force it to give up its homeland and implant another people in its place. Uh -huh. uh, and, I, and I see that as the thread, a thread of a colonial war, which has its outbursts and its, you know, periods when it's less less intense, obviously, over 100 years. So that's the first way in which I think this is new. It's not entirely new. Uh, others have used the settler colonial paradigm, uh, but it's very rare, I think, uh, certainly for the audiences I was hoping that would, you know, reach in the United States uh, to see things that way. Um, for many of them, it's tiny, beleaguered, poor, innocent little Israel being set upon by hordes of merciless anti-Semitic Arabs. Or, as I, as I suggested, it's a tragic conflict between two peoples, right against right, whatever. Uh, that's not really what happened at all. Uh, I, I'm not saying, you know, there are different narratives. Yeah, there are different narratives. Many of them are completely wrong. Uh, I am suggesting that this is the best way to see this, together with other aspects, obviously. The second um, w w reason I wrote the book and the second way in, in which it differs from everything I've ever done, because you're right, I've taken previous cuts at some of these issues, um, is to inject a personal element. Um, I, you know, I was rigorously trained uh, from my undergraduate and graduate days uh, to write in a certain way as a historian. Uh, whether I've done it well or badly is not the point. There's a style, there's an approach, there's a voice that we were, tra I was trained and we are trained to use. I don't, I do that to some extent. I mean, there's 45 pages of footnotes in this book. Um, there's, I, I hope, a rigorous documentary underpinning 
So some of the things that I say can be seen to be brand new or, or proven uh, uh, in a historic, as, as, as proper history. At the same time, however, I'm introducing material that is either uh, from my family history or the histories of other families or other individuals or my own personal experiences. And one doesn't usually do some of that in, uh -huh. in standard history writing. And I should say, by the way, that I found the footnotes some of the most entertaining reading in the book, too. I, I think you were having some pleasure in a lot of them uh, in uh, di dilating a little and even making some more personal observations. So, um, you know, you, you remind me that this book sort of begins with uh, uh, your Yusuf Diaz's letter to Herzl in 1899, uh, your great uncle, and I believe a mayor. Great, great, great. Oh, forgive me. And a for, former mayor of Jerusalem, is that right? And an Ottoman okay. official. And he says in very patient and uh, respectful and also personal terms, uh, he, he is making a communication to Herzl about uh, what you are attempting to do and how um, uh, it, it will never succeed. And in a sense, your book is also that type of communication um, because you were conveying this this uh, 120 years del delayed awareness to Americans. Do you have any sense that, uh, what is your sense of how you, I mean, how you were breaking through and whether uh, the extent, wh why this awareness hasn't broken through and what what evidence you have from the publication of this book that you are breaking through at all in the enormous resistance to this consciousness in the United States? Yeah, that, that's a hard question. It's a big one. I'm sorry to answer uh, because we're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, the, 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 the launch of the book was interrupted uh, by this horrible tragedy that's, that's befallen all of us worldwide. Um, obviously, it's impossible to tell what the reaction is or, 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 or is going to be. Um, and this may be a book that disappears as a result of the pandemic and has no impact. It may be a book that has a long shelf life and will, you know, grow in, in, in impact. I, I can't, I can't. Okay. Uh, I, I do say in the book, and I do believe that there's a fundamental change going on in the United States, in the American Jewish community, among young people, among minorities among the base of the Democratic Party, uh, in many churches, uh, among even politicians, even, even, the most impervious to you know, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, whether that will continue, I don't know. I'm a historian. I don't study the future. I don't predict the future. I can't tell you anything. I can tell you what I see now and how I see it having developed Got it. and from what. And there's a lot of that in the book. Um, and in that environment, I'm hoping that this book will give insight to people who are reachable. Now, I understand that especially as you go up the generational scale and get to older people, I'm much less likely to reach them. They probably have confirmed views, um, which are a result. You say, why has this not broken through? Well, partly because the Palestinians have never properly put their case, A, and B, because Zionism was a public relations machine, even as it was a colonial settler machine, a financial machine, a military machine, a state building machine. Uh, uh, it created a, a people, a, a modern national entity. I mean, it was doing all of those things, but it was a public relations and organizational uh -huh. machine. Uh -huh. Not only in Palestine, in fact, not mainly in Palestine, uh, uh, uh -huh. mainly in the United States and uh -huh. Europe. Uh, when David Ben Gurion and Yitzhak Ben Zvi, the first prime minister and the second president of the state of Israel, uh, are forced to leave. The Ottoman Empire, they're arrested by the Ottomans, they're in the army, they're arrested, they're expelled, deported. Um, they end up in New York. What do they do? They spent three years, or two, two and a half, three years organizing. When was wow. this? 1916, wow. 17, wow. 18. That's when the public relations work. Mm -hmm. That's when the organizational work. That's mm -hmm. when the financial mm -hmm. building of the financial basis mm -hmm. on which this amazing project mm -hmm. uh, was, was grounded began. Uh, so you're talking about people uh, amongst whom a tiny fraction speak any foreign language, uh, a, a fraction even are educated Palestinians, uh, as against a colonial settler movement made up of Europeans and Americans at the, at the outset, all of whom are native speakers of German and English and French and so forth, and all of whom are 
natives of these countries, in, in addition to which Zionism benefits from a partiality to the biblical narrative, uh -huh. uh, onto which it grafted its modern uh, national narrative. Uh -huh. uh, and uh -huh. that, makes it, that makes it an enormously powerful uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, argument uh, for not just evangelical Christians, any Christians, uh -huh. Bible readers of any sort, uh -huh. Jewish, Christian, and other. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons uh -huh. why the Palestinian narrative never really uh, uh -huh. had a chance. Uh -huh. uh, and to this day is, uh -huh. in my view, at, at, at a certain kind of disadvantage, uh -huh. especially with older people and people uh -huh. attached to the traditional. Great. Uh, one of the things that, I mean, I found important about the book is that you show the ways in which this settler colonialism defies uh, sort of conventional paradigm. And you just went into that now and some of the other ways that you, you, uh, we'll get to the um, uh, the, the Holocaust um, and the way that that uh, made uh, it sort of disqualified the France Fanon Algeria model, the, uh, that whole analysis, which is fascinating in the book. But I want to flip the script for a moment and say one of the asides that you make that is uh, in this book is you say, well, the settler colonialism here isn't that much different from what happened in Australia, New Zealand, the United States. Okay. And one of my reflections when I was reading that was, yeah, they got away with it, we got away with it, whoever, they got away with it in those countries, those lands, and there was a defeated people. And another exception to this whole, to flip the script, if we are going to look at exceptions to settler colonialism, from the time that your great uncle, great, great, great uncle wrote that letter to now, the Palestinian people are not, uh, evidently are not a defeated people. Is that, uh, and, and that is sort of, yeah, you know, you read this book and you see all these wars, on, the, the unending war on Palestine apparently hasn't been effective. You know, right. despite what you right. just said, all right. these forces, all this, uh, these metropole, right. the richest kind of the best public relations, they can speak a dozen languages, hasn't been effective in the end. Is, right. is that a correct reading? That is absolutely correct. Daniel Pipes in the New York Times says, and he's been saying for years, the Palestinians are defeated, and the only issue is to make them accept it. Uh, if the Palestinians were defeated, you would not need Daniel Pipes to be reiterating this every five minutes. Clearly, he's wrong. Uh, the very fact that, the, that Israel is still grappling with this issue, even though it's not any longer seen as an existential issue, it is proof that the Palestinians have not been defeated. But that's not the, the, the that was not the point of my comparison okay. to these four successful uh, settler colonial models, which is to say, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Mm -hmm. The point of that was an argument with people who wield settler colonialism as if it's a one size fits all explanation. It is not. Every settler colonial project is completely different. The 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 the, the Zionist project that leads to the creation of Israel and the establishment of this people is similar to these four in that like these four, it's created a nation, a nation state, a people, a sense of identity, uh, which has been in that respect completely successful. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and so it's not Algeria, it's not uh, uh, Rhodesia, uh, it's not South Africa, uh, uh -huh. where those projects failed. So most, most advocates of the settler colonial model are saying, Therefore, you know, this is going to fail. Well, in one respect, it hasn't failed. And moreover, using the settler colonial model doesn't mean that you don't have a people there. Uh -huh. Yes, you do have. There is an American people. Uh -huh. This is a settler colonial. I'm living in, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in Manhattan. Yes. That's not an Anglo-Saxon name. <laughs> uh, right. So it, we're in New York, yeah. named for the Duke of York, later James III, uh, sorry, James II. Uh, uh, but if, so there's this settler colonial patina on top of it. Um, but this is a successful settler colonial experiment. It's in that respect that I made this comparison. I see. So people could wake up and understand that to say something is a settler colonial project doesn't necessarily uh, mean certain things. You touched on Algeria there, and um, I, 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 it's a little in the weeds uh, intellectually, but I think it's very important to... Uh, bring up this point that you make in the book from, I believe, the Pakistani Iqbal Ahmad in uh, the 1980s, what he said or uh, uh, to Palestinian leadership that they sort of didn't want to hear, but that has been 
seem to be vindicated by history since. Can you explain this uh, sort of uh, minor but sort of uh, resonant um, historical episode to us? Sure. Uh, it needs a little bit of a backstory. Okay. Um, Iqbal Ahmed was a Pakistani uh, who walked across India with Gandhi, uh, came to the States, became an intellectual, was a friend of Edward Said and uh, Ibrahim Abu Lughud, uh, and uh, had earlier in his life uh, worked with the FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale, the Algerian National Liberation Movement. And so he knew Fanon. Uh, I believe in Tunis, uh, where, where, where they briefly uh, interacted. Uh, and so he was no opponent of anti-colonial violence, quite the contrary. Uh, he, 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 you know, he'd seen the future and it worked in Algeria. Uh, uh, if you've seen the Battle of Algiers, you know, uh, uh, you don't want us to use women putting bombs in baskets in ca coffee shops. Give us your tanks and your guns and your planes and we'll give you the women with bombs in baskets. Um, that's the interrogation of, 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 a, of a captured terrorist by the French in the, in the movie. Wow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and so he'd been there and seen it. And uh, so when he, he was asked to go to South Lebanon, when the PLO was still there in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, before 1982, um, I assume that the PLO leadership uh, was expecting him to come back with some kind of glowing report about uh, the strategy of armed struggle. What he came back with was a damning uh, 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 report, which said this is the wrong approach. Uh, uh, obviously, not coming from a from a from a position which opposed violence in principle, or or or, or certain kinds of anti-colonial struggle, but saying in this time, in this place, and in particular against this enemy, this is the wrong approach. This will not work. And he he adduced many other reasons, but the key part that I mention in the book is he was saying, this is a case where when you use this means, you strengthen your enemy uh -huh. Uh -huh. against the Jewish people or against uh -huh. the state of Israel, uh -huh. against the Israelis. Uh -huh. This kind of approach, this kind of strategy is counterproductive. Uh -huh. If there were any doubt about that, I think the second intifada was a conclusive proof. That is to say, the, the, the uprising that started in 2000 and that led to an enormous amount of of death and destruction, much more on the Palestinian side than the Israeli, but including horrific suicide bombings in Israeli cities and towns, uh -huh. uh, and a very high civilian death count on uh -huh. the Israeli side, and a, a, a even higher, obvious, death count on the Palestinian uh -huh. side. This was a massive defeat for the Palestinian national movement. This was a colossal strategic mistake. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This was something that Israeli analysts have shown the Israeli army was preparing for uh, and 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 it's a war that they won, uh -huh. every level, uh, uh, strategic, tactical, uh -huh. informational, and diplomatic. Uh -huh. uh, and it's proof, if any proof were needed, uh, of the veracity of of, of what Ahmed uh, was saying. I want to move on to um, uh, another element um, uh, uh, that was supposed to possibly produce a. Um, uh, uh, an outcome and peaceful outcome, and that was the peace process. That takes so called the so called peace process, and this is a great part of the book. To Can me, you think of a culinary process that goes on for decades and produces no food? <laughs> you can never get dinner. <laughs> I mean, any think of any kind of process which has never produced an outcome that it's supposed to be. That's funny. At. You can't call it the peace process. You call it a process. Okay. It's a management of the conflict process. It's a process to deceive and fool people. It's not a peace process. Yeah. No peace. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, okay. I, it's well, points well taken. So um, one of the, I mean, I, 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 this takes up a lot of the second half of the book. And there's a great anecdote that sort of begins it from my standpoint is when uh, you're, you as a fairly young man in 91 are going to... Uh, in the, making a visitation to an elder in Jerusalem to try to sort out some family issue that has been happening in your uh, large and, um, uh, uh, you know, legendary family. And uh, this gentleman asks you to become an advisor on uh, the uh, Palestinian, for Palestinian negotiators um, in a different setting from the PLO. And so you were, had, a front, you had a front row seat to this. Uh, process to this uh, Madrid Oslo process. Well, actually, and, to the 
to the Madrid and Washington uh, phases. I, I had nothing to do with Oslo. Uh, that okay. was done by a different group behind our back it, 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 without our knowledge. Uh, but there's a, you, you, that's, be that as it may, there's a very vivid rendering of what was happening in Oslo in this book because you right. were talking to people. Okay. And your, um, uh, uh, you, your, Everyone is today cynical about Oslo. It's it, or a lot of people are cynical about Oslo. You had this uh, lack of faith at that time, so right. I, I I've thrown a lot at you again. Another one of these omnibus rambling questions that I leave uh, um, an interview e nowhere to clear to go. But you should take it away. Tell me what um, what. Uh, how cynical should we be? And were you cynical? How cynical were you then? And what did you have any idealism about that, the prospects of that undertaking? Well, I wouldn't have spent a better part of two and a half years doing it if I didn't think it was worthwhile. I actually reflect in the book, looking back after almost 40 years, um, as to whether it was worthwhile. Um, but at the time, I think that I mistakenly assumed a number of things. The first is that the first Intifada, which I describe in my book as an enormous success for the Palestinian people, uh, mainly nonviolent, popular, locally organized, later on taken over by the PLO, but originally a spontaneous uprising starting in December 1987. Um, I, I, I assumed that that had wrought an enormous change in both Israeli and American public opinion and had changed the strategic position of the Palestinians. Um, there is some evidence that that's the case. I mean, Itamar Rabinovich's biography of, of Yitzhak Rabin shows that, yes, it had a profound impact on Israeli, not only Israeli public opinion, but Israeli decision makers. Uh, I think I overestimated both the impact on the United States and on Israel. Um, but I, the conjuncture of that with the end of the Cold War, with the George H.W. Bush presidency, with the arrival of a, in my view, one of the more competent people to hold the office of Secretary of State, James Baker, uh, I think convinced me, I now realize wrongly, that there was an opportunity here. As I show in the book, what I and we didn't realize is that there were much deeper structural reasons why this process was designed not to lead to the outcome uh -huh. which we were working towards. We were working towards Palestinian statehood and sovereignty, complete sovereignty, jurisdiction, authority, control over most of the territories or all of the territories occupied in 1967 uh -huh. uh, in a state that would uh, uh, be involved in a peaceful relationship with the state of Israel. Uh -huh. uh, that was impossible in terms of the structural basis on which these negotiations took place by agreement, prior agreement, going, in fact, back a very long time uh -huh. between the United States and Israel, going back in some cases to the 70s, uh -huh. going back to the peace treaty of 1979 between Egypt and Israel, which laid out a whole bunch of parameters which have been scrupulously respected by Israel and the United States ever since, uh -huh. and which were designed to prevent ever the creation of a sovereign, independent Palestinian state. That has what happened. That is what has happened. Those are outcomes that were determined by the balance of forces, but were laid down by American-Israeli agreements. Let's go back, as I say, in some cases to the late, the mid '70s, in some cases to the late '70s. If any of you're interested, read the book, the details. Right. Yeah. We did not know that, uh -huh. we should have maybe. Uh -huh. We could have. Uh, we were warned by a few people. Uh -huh. Edward Said, for example, uh, was one of a, a few people who said pointed some of these things out. Um, so there were many reasons why we were actually mistaken in our assumptions. We did try. I mean, in our, in our work in Washington in particular, we pushed as far as we could the boundaries that were established by these parameters. Uh, and we failed. Uh -huh. And in fairness, I mean, uh, or not in fairness, but I mean, part of the great work in this book is to show what, how much has been revealed since then about that process. I mean, you achieve a very painful understanding uh, in this book, and um, the reader does too. Uh, but before we get to that present frame, I just want to uh, do one more historical anecdote. 
you met uh, Arafat on a number of occasions. A couple of them are uh, 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 related in this book. Can you just tell us a little about Arafat and uh, the manner in which uh, you so um, uh, um, irritated him on one occasion? Um, I think I irritated him on a number of occasions. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't. I don't recall offhand which one is recounted in the book. Um, I think. I mean, it, I, the one that really struck me is, you know, you're in Jerusalem or you're in Ramallah. I forget where you were living. You can't move around. Suddenly, right. you're, you know, you had been able to drive anywhere you wanted. Already, your life is being circumscribed. Oh, yeah. The yeah, lives of Palestinians are being circumscribed. Right. And you were right. bringing this news to Arafat. I mean, and, 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 and you obviously show a great deal of respect for him at the same time. He's being lionized at that time. He's under siege in Janine, I think, uh, in... Uh, uh, no, no, he was in, he was in Gaza. I, I remember... In Ramallah. Yeah. He was in and, Gaza. He was in Gaza. I was living in Jerusalem at the time. Oh, but then subsequently you met him when he was in under siege in Ramallah, right? Didn't you see him? I did, much oh, later, yes. I yes. Just, oh, forgive uh, me. Forgive me. I'm, he died. I'm blurring the two episodes. Forgive me. Uh, but they're both these vivid... Uh, you have such a great portrait of this man who was flawed, heroic, and, uh, you know, his very health was being attacked. And you even mentioned that plane crash. I never knew about the plane crash. So tell us yeah, a little I, about Arafat before. Yeah, the plane crash. Well, I, I don't think he was ever the same after the plane crash myself. Yeah, before that, he was, uh, I, I, had, I, had, I had seen him in Beirut enough to know uh, uh, that this was a man with an extraordinary memory. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept... I mean, he had a he had a some kind of hard disk in his brain that was extraordinarily capacious, um, and it was part of his uh, the secret of his success. I think um, this amazing ability to understand people's strengths and weaknesses, know everything about them. Uh, he was he was in that respect he was remarkable. And one thing I noticed in the encounters I had with him at, subsequent to the plane crash is that that memory had deteriorated. Interesting. Long before he became sick, though it, it became much more evident when he was sick in, uh -huh. in, 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 and sort of imprisoned uh, by Sharon's forces in uh -huh. his headquarters in Ramallah towards the end of his life. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, the incident that you mention is uh, when he, was, uh, he had returned to Gaza and he uh -huh. was, as you say, being lionized. Uh -huh. And I was, by this stage, pretty jaundiced uh, uh -huh. in my attitude towards him. Because I had been living on and off in Palestine for a while at that stage, uh, basically doing the work on, on a book uh, uh -huh. during which I, I encountered Yusuf Di al Khaldi's papers for the first uh -huh. time. Um, and in that context, I was seeing what was happening in particular in Jerusalem. Uh -huh. I was seeing the beginning of a closure that was meant to choke Jerusalem off from its uh, West Bank hinterland uh -huh. um, and, the, and the settlements that were ongoing to create a belt uh, around the city, eastern East Jerusalem, Arab East Jerusalem, and I went to I went with uh, a cousin of mine to uh, Gaza to meet to see him, and I my the only reason I wanted to see him because I had I was already very disillusioned with with uh, with uh, Oslo, I could see that where where things were going. I had written an op-ed at the time of the signing in in September in the in New York Times actually in the time of the uh, of the signing of the uh, Oslo Accords in 1993 in September. Uh, expressing skepticism about it, and by this stage, I was much more. I was not. I was beyond skeptical. I could see that we were going headlong down a cliff, uh, and so I went to him to tell him, "For heaven's sakes, pay attention to what is going on in Jerusalem." And he could not have been more dismissive. Wow. Um, I spoke also to Abu Mazen. Actually, one of the few times I ever spoke to them, and the last time I spoke to him, in fact. Um, uh, and it, it, it convinced me of the complete uselessness of talking to either of them for that matter. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. They were oblivious. Uh, uh -huh. Much later, when Arafat was sick, um, uh, my friend, my old friend, Sadin Sebi, dragged me to see him uh -huh. a couple of times in the Mukhata, where he was uh -huh. under siege, uh -huh. just before he died. But that was out of respect. I see. Than any hope of, you know, I, I, I had long since given up the idea that I could communicate with him. Uh -huh. In fact, I had, we had learned this in Amman at the meeting of the Palestine National Council, which a number of us went to, and which is described in the book, mm -hmm. at which we were trying to tell him stuff about the United States, and he couldn't, again, for, in a different way, he couldn't have been more dismissive. Mm -hmm. So I, I had learned long ago yeah. not to rely on the ability 
of these people to listen to anybody or anything talking sense. Iqbal Ahmed learned it in the early 80s. I learned it subsequently. I think that one of the things that I found so moving about this book or, or sort of dis dispiriting was that you showed that um, the settler colonialism has been based on this idea that I grew up mocking that was, I thought of as stale and out of the uh, crumbling history books that uh, people from these quote unquote advanced societies were going to bestow these great gifts on uh, these benighted people and they would benefit from it. And certainly uh, Herzl's response to your great, great, great uncle includes that type of arrogant. Um, I mean, there's also ethnic cleansing in Herzl's uh, thinking at that time and, and traditional colonial approaches to indigenous people, but also we're going to be a great boon to you. And one of the things, again, that I found exciting about the book is the way you would, in which you show that that attitude is just very present in Israeli thinking and Zionist and Israeli advocates thinking to this day. You know, they really believe that, hey, we're making it great for those Palestinians and those Arabs, you know. So well, uh, it starts it starts from an assumption of superiority and inferiority. Uh -huh. At first, they're inferior. They're barbarians, yeah. whatever. They're backwards, whatever term you use. And we are superior. And inevitably, necessarily, we are going to impart to them some of the fruits of our superiority. That's how colonial mentalities go and have always gone um, uh, throughout history. And, and I think that part of the rage that's latent in this book at times is the insult to Palestinian civilization that you convey even in those first chapters about the enormous library that your family had created and the vast learning that existed among several members of your family. Um, which, you know, eradicated, uh, in some cases, not eradicated, but when you talk about the uh, uh, destruction in Jer old Jerusalem after 67, you describe these places that were eradicated, that were right. uh, uh, just kind of living, I mean, monuments of history that were just... To, to, to create the Kotel Plaza, exactly. Yeah. To create so, the plaza in front of the Western Wall. Yeah, so it's very upsetting to read that. And I guess what I'm where I, 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 you know, yet there is a sense toward the end of this book that this paradigm is not going to be a successful one. So why do you have, I mean, uh, some of that is familiar to us. I mean, we've heard about the changes in the Democratic Party among the young. I want to believe it. But uh, you, you seem to, the book ends on a somewhat hopeful note. And after you know, witnessing this onslaught that you chronicle and these insults in this very vivid personal way, yet it can maintain this type of buoyancy and hope. Why? Well, because even though the remnants of settler colonialism are still with us, even though many settler colonial societies have yet to fully own up to some of the aspects of their origins and deal with them in an honest way. This country most notably, much, much it has done much less to come to terms either with slavery uh, and the racial and other ills that have flown from it, or the destruction of Native American society uh, and its replacement with this settler colonial society we live in, um, which is not a matter of, you know, uh, self you know, self-flagellation. Uh -huh. It's a matter of understanding the roots of the society, coming to terms with it, and making up for it to the extent that we can do it. Some others have done a better job. Canada and Australia and New Zealand have done, frankly, a much better job. Uh, Israel has done a terrible job. Um, and the point here is that settler colonialism is dead in the sense of an ideology that can justify itself in the 21st century. Uh, this is most apparent in Europe, uh, where the Europe's colonial past is debated, obviously. There are still defenders of it in places like France, but they're on the back foot. Everybody understands that colonialism did enormous harm, whether it was settler colonialism or other forms of colonialism. Um, we have yet to fully come to that reckoning in the United States, so we're, we're getting there. My point here is that, as Tony Judd said, 
uh, Zionism was in a certain sense out of time. Uh -huh. It was a it was it was a project that was in in keeping with the ethos of an age which was passing or had passed, and that age continued certainly up until World War II. Colonialism did not have a bad odor in uh -huh. 1920 or 30, uh -huh. and so you have Zionist leaders who perfectly openly talk about themselves as engaged in a colonial project, describing their institutions as the Jewish colonization agency or whatever, um, right up to World War II. And everything flips in World War II. Decolonization takes place. Colonialism is in a bad odor the world over. The, the colonial, whether settler colonies or others, are slowly but surely dismantled. Uh, ending most recently with South Africa, but including much of East Africa and, and Algeria. Uh -huh. um, and so you have this anomaly, this historical anomaly in Israel. Israel is different. All settler colonial uh, projects are different. Israel was not an, ex the Zionist project was not an extension of the mother country. Every other one was. Uh -huh. Dutch settlers were sent by Holland to this island. They were part of Holland. It was called New Holland. We are New York. Okay, York, England, every every town in, in, in the United States that has an English name is an extension of the mother wow. country. They did the same thing in Algeria. Okay, the Dutch and then later the British do the same thing in South Africa. Zionism was different. It, it, it obtained patronage of great powers. It couldn't have succeeded without that patronage, but it was not an extension of Britain. It was a separate, independent national movement. Uh -huh. uh, as I try and say, you know, you can you can walk and chew gum at the same time. It was a national movement at the same time uh -huh. that it was a settler colonial movement. Uh -huh. The United States was starts as a settler colonial project. It becomes a national uh -huh. project. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This is not rocket science. I'm terribly sorry. Those people who think of settler colonialism as some evil, you know, unique thing that has to be seen in certain terms are mistaken. Um, so the reason I'm optimistic, just to summarize yes, this, sure. is to say that this is a thing that's out of time. This uh -huh. is a project that's out of time. That doesn't mean that it's not successful in a certain sense. Uh -huh. Having created a sense of peoplehood with uh -huh. many flaws, but a sense of peoplehood. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean uh, that the, the thing is going to collapse tomorrow. Uh -huh. It simply means that being based in originally Western European and North American uh, liberal democracies, a, a project that is ultimately not liberal and ultimately anti-democratic, uh -huh. the Israeli Knesset and the Israeli security apparatus rules over absolutely the entire population of Palestine, most of whom are Arabs. Between the river and the sea, there's one sovereignty. Between the river and the sea, there's one state. There's one population register and so on and so forth, all controlled by the state of Israel. That's not democratic. That's anti-democratic. That's colonial. You can call it whatever you want, uh, but it's not. And uh, the, that ethos is not in keeping with the ethos of liberal democracies. Now, the West may turn away from liberal democracy, in which case the Netanyahu's of this world will have a much easier time. Uh -huh. But I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. And, 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 and in any case, it's not the case right now. So the values that Israel ultimately embodies, which is not just a, you know rescue of the Jews from oppression elsewhere, and not just all the things that we know uh, or a connection to biblical Israel, it is those things. But it is also, among other things, uh, replacing one people with another, and ruling over that people, and having rights for one group that another group doesn't have within the same polity, and that's an inexorable process. Drawing everybody under the, the sovereignty and law of the state of Israel has been going on uh, since 1948 and accelerated in 1967, accelerated further with the nation state law uh, of a year and a half ago. Yes. So I'm arguing that, it, that in effect, Zionism is against the tide of history. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Historical reasons why it emerged, there are historical uh -huh. reasons to understand why people supported it, but yes. it has these issues. Now, will that ultimately lead to a change? I don't know. I, I Again, I'm a historian. I'm telling you where we are today, as far as I can tell, based on my reading of the past. Um, I, I, I do think those are some reasons for optimism. Right. Right. Um, you observe that settler colonialism is, uh, colonialism was in bad odor, has been for a long time, or for a while. Zionism has a different status, but it, 
I, I think it is beginning to get that bad odor, too. You are right now, I think, within a stone's throw of the Craft Center at, uh, for Jewish Life at uh, Columbia. There, it's a, an institution funded by a leading Two blocks scientist. away. Two blocks away. Sorry. You, well, I think you could. You have a good arm. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Columbia University is an institution where a lot of Zionists have had a lot of... Um, of uh, Influence or traction. There have been been educated. Barry Weiss was okay, and and God knows that um, your work there, setting up the Center for Palestine Studies, um, uh, the collegial work you've done there. Some of that has been against some pretty stiff headwinds, um, and I guess I'm just wondering where, uh, when you say that uh, um, I, you didn't use these words, but if Zionism is a dead letter, is that evidence to uh, in your environs in Manhattan? Um, I mean, I, I would put the thing in broader context. I okay. think that the success of uh, arguments against the standard traditional Zionist narrative has driven an extraordinary pushback, or has created an extraordinary pushback. Uh -huh. This is true in academia. This is true on college campuses. This is true politically. Uh -huh. There are dozens of organizations Funded uh -huh. up the wazoo, yes. lawyered up the wazoo. Yes. Ad men and ad women, you know, PR people up the yes. wazoo yes. who are fighting tooth and nail against this new version, whether it's in school books, textbooks, whether it's in the university, uh, uh -huh. on the university curricula, whether it's on university faculties, whether it's on the board of trustees of universities, whether it's in state legislatures. Uh, uh, whether it's in terms of legislation against boycott, divestment, and sanctions, uh, whether it's in frivolous lawsuits, uh -huh. whether it's in uh, 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 Trump appointees like, uh, what's his name, Marcus, uh, uh -huh. in the Department yeah. of Education, yeah. bringing harassing uh, 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 actions against Middle East and centers at universities. Uh -huh. There is a huge uh -huh. pushback uh -huh. to a remarkably successful a change uh -huh. in the atmosphere. I mean, we have the Barnard student body voted in favor of divestment yeah. from companies that support the occupation uh, two years ago. Uh, uh -huh. We had a vote authorized at Columbia by students, the student government by a majority uh -huh. vote. Brown University, I could go, you know, these, we yes. know about these things. Um, uh, the, 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 the change in academia in terms, especially some, some fields, uh -huh. mainly true in the humanities and some of the social sciences, the kind of complete falsehood that could be peddled in the 40s, 50s, and 60s has pretty much disappeared from respectable scholarship. Wow. And you now have a much more nuanced view from a variety of academic perspectives. Uh, things that were unchallenged when I was an undergraduate in the 60s are completely inconceivable, except for the tiny, narrow range of people who really are a minority of any group. They're a minority among Jewish students. They're a minority mm -hmm. among right-wing students. They're a minority, you know, mm -hmm. the people who believe some of these fairy tales yes. that were once taken. So there have been changes in various areas, and the pushback has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's 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 well funded. It's much of it is centrally coordinated. You see exactly the same memes yes. in London as you see in Berlin, as you see on college campuses here. You see exactly the same arguments. You see exactly the same legal tactics. There is clearly a huge degree of coordination. Uh, a, 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 and we're told that the yeah. Eldon Adelsons are spending this much. The yeah. singers, they say, we're going to yeah. do this for birthright. We're going to do this to oppose BDS. Here's 10 million. Here's 20 million. Yeah. Here's no, so this is public knowledge. Yes. Against which you have a almost unfunded grassroots uh -huh. process going on. Uh -huh. And, you know, uh, I, 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 I don't want to seem over optimistic. I don't want to yeah. paint too rosy a picture. But it's in, it, on our campus, on many other campuses, it's, it's something of a fair fight. You know, the big bucks, the big battalions, all the lawyers in the world uh, against basically students, uh -huh. Uh -huh. academics. Uh -huh. or right-thinking people in churches uh -huh. or synagogues or whatever it may be. Um, so, I mean, that's the background to this. It's not, uh -huh. it's not a Columbia issue. It's not even a campus issue. Okay. The, campuses, the campuses are the flashpoint 
okay. because a lot of people have realized, oh my God, this is the future generation. Yeah. If they have this modified view of reality, <laughs> we are in right. deep, deep, deep trouble. If yeah. the kids yeah. whom we've spent such a amount, amount of time brainwashing yeah. have some of them, a large proportion, a proportion of them have managed to overcome the effects of that, uh, there's a problem. Yes. Uh, and, that, and that's driving this. His, it, it's almost hysterical. Uh, if you see what the Department of Education is doing or yeah. you see some of the state laws uh, to ban BDS yeah, yeah. activities, you can see that there is a level of hysteria and panic which yes. betokens a sense that they're in trouble. I agree with you. That, that's a great answer. And thank you. Um, and thanks for your time, Rashid. You brought up Corona and how people are doing. How are you doing? Just before we end, how are you doing with this? How's your family? Uh, and uh, do you have any his, um, historical scholarly observations about Corona that you want to impart to us? Um, no, I just hope everybody listening and watching is okay and takes care and is safe and is well uh, and is smart and don't <laughs> ingest bleach or listen to the clowns who unfortunately govern us. Um, we, are, we are very poorly led at, um, at, at a very bad moment, and we're not the only ones who are badly led in the United States. There are a number of other leaders who have failed this test already, and they're gonna, are gonna go down in history uh, as bumbling fools. Uh, worse, actually, criminally bumbling fools. Um, you know, I, have, I know many people who've been affected, a colleague, uh, friends, uh, relatives. Um, uh, one friend of mine, Michael Sorkin, died uh, of um, the architect Michael Sorkin, um, who was just about to publish. I just wrote a blurb for it, a wonderful book, uh, together with a group of architects on Gaza. Um, and I have many other friends who have recovered or others on those students. I'm sorry. Um, so, so, you know, my, so far so good. But it's, you know, this is, this is unfortunately going to be with us for a while. Some of this could have been prevented, should have been prevented. It wasn't, and we have to deal with that now. Uh, and the time for the reckoning uh, with the people who didn't do what they might have done is, it will come eventually. Uh, we just have to deal with this and get through it. It will be, it'll be a huge trial, and it'll be a trial for people outside the United States in, in, in developing countries uh, that'll be much harsher than it will be for our country. It'll be worse for our country because it's being mismanaged both economically and, 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 and epidemiologically. Uh -huh. But um, uh, some places have handled it better than others. Uh, some places in Europe, uh, some places in the Middle East. I mean, Israel, Jordan, a few, the Palestinian Authority of all yes. places. Gaza. All, all of them handled it a lot better yeah. than many other places. But that's, this is only the beginning. Uh -huh. uh, as, we, as we are necessarily going to have to open up some parts of our societies and economies, uh -huh. It will get worse, and I'm afraid it'll get worse in uh, some other societies in the United States. Obviously, it will affect poor people who have to work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are obliged to go to unsafe places, yes. partly because our, the oligarchs who control most societies are not going to guarantee their safety or do any the minimum necessary yes. to guarantee their safety, or because they do jobs that it's hard to guarantee safety. Yeah. Um, but that's going to be with us for a while, and, and, and the, the, the ripples of it through societies outside this country uh, are going to be much greater, I'm afraid, than here. And we're all in it together is the problem. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot cordon off a society. Uh, the movement between states, between countries, uh, has been much reduced and can be reduced indefinitely, but it can't be completely stopped. Yes. So if it yes. starts in Malawi, it's going to affect other countries yeah. and ultimately Europe. If it starts in, in Central America, it's going to affect other countries and eventually the United States and so on. So uh, it, there has to be a holistic and global approach. And we're led by the most narrow-minded, pig-headed, yeah. isolationist leaders in, 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 in generations, uh, in, in this country in particular, but in a number of other countries who don't understand that holistic uh, global aspect. I mean, the world has been uh, uh, globalized for centuries. Uh, the plague of 1720 starts because of imports into Marseille. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, huh? yeah, well, you, you yeah. already had global, yeah. a, a global, a global economy yes. in the 18th, early 18th century. Um, nice. And we have an even more global economy today. The New York Times today reports that New York City was the locus for the spread of the infection. Well, I mean, we have three airports. We have people coming in from mm -hmm. Europe and China. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have, as I said, 20, 15, 20 flights to Tel Aviv a day. Uh, more than that to England. More than that, as many to Italy and, and Spain, all of which were foci yeah. of the infection. Yes. So, you know, uh, th th that was the world before Corona. Uh, it, it, that's changed now. I mean, I haven't seen, I see one airplane a week. Wow. In wow. New York. I mean, there are more. There must be other flight paths. Yeah. But, you know, United had a dozen flights to Chicago from Newark and a dozen from La to LaGuardia. Wow. The other day they had one from LaGuardia and two from Newark. My Lord. <laughs> and those planes huh. were told are largely yeah. empty. Huh. So it's going to be a, a, a brave new horrible world for a while, unfortunately. Uh, we haven't even come to terms with the depression mm. that we're going to mm. hold face. Mm. Well, that's sobering, and I thank you greatly for the insights, and uh, thank you for your time, Rashid, and uh, congratulations. And Thank you for giving me the opportunity, guys.